when you wrote the book, This Great Spiritual Migration, we spent three weeks uh, looking at it in sermons and, and looking at the various shifts that you talked about. And the question, the first question that comes from me is, is the pandemic going to accelerate or derail the great spiritual migration that you write about? Well, I, as in most things, I think the answer is both. Uh, first of all, the fact that you and I are having a conversation like this and that we're having church remote tells us that uh, um, levels of change that people never would have voted for and never would have accepted it, they've adjusted to pretty amazingly in a matter of, a, a matter of weeks. Uh, if you had told people that they could have church online, they would have given you a thousand reasons why not. Uh, I know there's debates in some churches whether they can have communion online and there's people still holding the line on that. What they don't realize is when they get back together, it will be even more dangerous to have communion in person. So, uh, you know, so the changes are compressed and acceler accelerated. But I think there are other people who all of this just makes them more desperate to try to cling to a status quo that is harder and harder to cling to. And I think we should expect to see that happening as well. Mm. Someone asked me the other day, is this, is this uh, pandemic uh, a snowstorm, which you don't know have a lot about in Florida, about a snowstorm or a season or an epic uh, experience? What, do you, what would you say to that question? How do you see yeah. this? It's funny, I, just this morning I was talking with some people about an article that just appeared in the New York Times by John Meacham about the Black Death. And uh, some people, uh, some historians think it wasn't Martin Luther and the printing press that brought about the modern era, but it was the Black Death. Um, that the plagues that spread through Europe in the late Middle Ages caused so much death and so much destruction, and they didn't fit in traditional theological parameters. You know, it, people who are biblical literalists read the Bible and think, oh, diseases happen because God is bringing a plague, or even the devil is bringing a plague. And, and you know, that was so deeply embedded in the way people read the Bible and in their assumptions about God. But when they actually experienced a plague, they realized this takes good people more than bad people. This, this is completely non-discriminate, indiscriminate. This there is no theological justification for the suffering and pain that's going on. And, uh, and of course, people have already tried it. Remember with HIV, they tried to say, oh, this is you know, God's judgment on gay people. So people try to do that sort of thing. But with a pandemic that touches almost everyone in one way or another, and everyone by touching the economy, um, people are going to realize, oh, a lot of our theological assumptions, the way we thought the world worked, works, it can't take this into account. And, and so I think what's going, what, what we're going to see is at the very core of this, a theological shift in, in what we believe about God and God's relationship to the universe. And, uh, and that's going to, I think that's going to have far reaching effects. Now, I should also say, never underestimate people's ability to be in denial. So I'm sure a whole lot of people will just be able to swat all this away and, and stick with their old thinking. But I think it's going to accelerate the, the need for congregations like yours that don't tell people they have to check their brains in the parking lot and that say, no, faith, is, it, it, faith requires and challenges us to open our minds and face all the facts and bring all of that in, uh, into, uh, into account in our, in our spiritual lives. Uh, so with that, how will we, you know, my, uh, I, I concur and I sense my worry is that people are going to quickly go, let's go back to the way it was. Let's just carry on. Let's forget it. How do we, how do we hold people to account and say, no, let's sit in this? Well, here's the, the thing that's different. With the bubonic plagues 500 years ago and more, and with the, uh, with the Spanish flu 100 years ago, uh, and even with HIV, uh, you know, just a generation ago, um, we are far more globally connected than we ever were then. We have a global economy. And if we think we're going to be able to shut down the global equ economy quickly um, without any ramifications, you know, I think we, we just don't realize how connected we are. So I'm sure that farmers in Alberta sell a lot of their crops uh, to, to the Chinese. And so you put a, a, a quarantine lineup and you know, it, and 
people are going to feel it, even if they don't feel they're, they're part of the global economy. We're just farmers or whatever. No, we're part of a global economy. Uh, and so I don't think any of us can estimate where this is going to go. And I, I hate to sound dire, but I live south of the border, so I have to. I think we shouldn't underestimate that when things get shaky, like imagine if enough people are unemployed long enough and are hungry long enough that we start having food riots. You can imagine the, de the demagogues coming in, clamping down on that. You can imagine the level of autocratic control that would come in to try to suppress that kind of unrest. It could be super far reaching and it could change things that we assume when we use a word like democracy. And, and, and maybe that's easier to imagine happening on my side of the border than yours, but I think we shouldn't be unrealistic. Human beings, have, we have similar, we have a fear of chaos and people are willing to put up with an awful lot of uh, autocracy in order to protect themselves from chaos. And, and it's just too soon to know if we will be able to go back to the old normal or if already the cat's out of the bag. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think any of us know, but if, if there's one word I would say is important at a time like this, it's preparedness. And preparedness means that you don't have only one fix in mind. You don't have only a, one plan. You, you need a whole set of scenarios of how we adjust to an uncertain future. That, that, that word, is the word adaptable too, to be adaptable to this? Adaptable, agile, exactly right. Yeah. And of course, it's a reminder to us that plagues are huge biological events, and sometimes they're extinction events. And, and in a certain sense, what we are finding ourselves subject to once again is that we're part of a biosphere on planet Earth where what Charles Darwin said really turns out to be true. If you're not adaptable, uh, you don't survive. And, and so adaptability, agility, flexibility, creativity, they really become deeply important. And of course, you and I, we believe that those are characteristics of spirit. Those are characteristics of true faith. But there are a lot of people, those are the last words they think of, <laughs> agile, adaptable, uh, when they think of religion and with good reason. <laughs> Yeah, or or in your book uh, on the Galapagos, you talk about playfulness as part of that as well, too. That whole uh, way of being in the world, of being adaptable to to the world around us and play playful in it uh, is so important. I want to just uh, go back to the Bible for a second because we a few weeks ago we explored the apocalypse. So we interviewed a theologian from Vancouver School of Theology on the book of Revelation, and he was helping us understand the book and about Apocalypse about, is about an unveiling, about looking at what is hidden and looking at ourselves and, and what's there. And a person from Vancouver has given me a, a question for you around this, wondering about uh, in, in that book and the talk of the, uh, the great beast uh, and the battle there, what's, what's your take uh, as you see this with uh, the 1% uh, in the economy? And, how they're responding, if we're all a part of this, how do you see us responding uh, to this in a way that um, brings a sense of not putting uh, consumerism and capitalism and, and get the economy going as the God, but perhaps reshifting and um, seeing what's hidden in a new way? What's, what's your take on the, uh, the apocalyptic talk? Yeah, well, first of all, that word, that's the perfect definition of that word. It's an unveiling. Uh, and so, you know, even the idea in the book of Revelation with the beast, the idea is behind what looks like a benign government is actually a ravenous beast. Uh, and, of course, this is the language Jesus used, too, when he talked about, you know, the, uh, on the surface, uh, you know, they, they seem like well manicured uh, lawns, but underneath are dead men's bones. You know, we're walking on a cemetery that there are bodies hidden in this field. And so that that certainly is apropos. On my side of the border, we see this where African-Americans are 133 percent. I read yesterday in one state more likely to die of uh, COVID-19 than white people uh, and how. Uh, the disease is not evenly distributed because uh, because of disparities of wealth, disparities of healthcare, and so on. 
And I'm sure you have parallel issues uh, on your side of the border and in different regions. But uh, what, what, this, what this says to me is that we're having an unveiling of the fissures and weaknesses and imperfections, and in fact, design flaws, because a lot of these were intentionally designed of the status quo. And the opportunity that we can seize here is that as their destabilization, and maybe in some places even kinds of collapse, and you can never say that lightly because I don't think any of us know fully what that means. But when those things happen, this is where preparedness comes in. So what we realize now is that once the ugly truth is unveiled, what are we going to do about it? And we have a chance now to say, what would a saner economy be? What would a, a better way of rebuilding be? Let's not just try to get back to where we were. Let's try to move forward to something, to something better. I'll give you a quick example. We all know that fossil fuels are a problem. And, and in Alberta, you feel this in, in a special way. But one thing's for sure, the airline industries aren't coming back anytime soon. And, and it's possible that this COVID-19 could last for years and that we can never crowd in on airplanes like we used to be. Well, what will that mean? It'll mean the prices will go up. What will that mean? The demand will go down. The fact that we're all becoming much more comfortable communicating visually, but at a distance like we're doing now, might mean that a whole lot of us say, why do I want to bother the risk of getting on a plane and the hassle? So we could end up with a situation where demand for fossil fuels goes down and we could seize upon that and make that a, a good thing for the planet, as well as we'd have to help all the people who lose jobs and all the rest. There are going to be you know, new challenges there. But, but that's what I mean. An unveiling and a destabilization uh, creates moments of opportunity if we're creative enough to seize them. One other quick example. How many families who've been forced to spend time around um, their, their spouses and kids <laughs> that they've been spending? Of course, probably a lot of them have had big fights and, and you know, it's not been pleasant. But I think for a whole lot of folks, they're going to think, what was I missing? You know, why would I ever want to go back to the rat race I was part of? There's been something humane about this. And so all of that could be opportunities for us to seize. Yeah, I totally think that, uh, that we're going to have to re-examine our health care, our education, our obviously our church, our relationships, just as you say, so the, the hope is that, you know, in the order, disorder, reorder, the disorder we're in, we, we don't quickly rush to go back, that we move forward. Um, I've read your, your book, uh, Galapagos Islands, uh, and enjoyed it immensely. And uh, looked again this morning at uh, your, your last chapter on echo theology. Um, yes. Can you say something about that? Uh, you might want to explain that term for folks and then just say how you see this. You know, I think you see it as an opportunity. Yes, well, I mean, one thing's for sure. Let's say it like this. In October or November of last year, uh, we weren't guessing that this would be the pandemic. There are a lot of people who are telling us, they've been telling us for decades, someday a pandemic's going to come. Uh, I, I should just say, when I was a pastor in the Washington, D.C. area, I had a lot of scientists in my church, and this is where they spent their entire careers. I remember one fellow, his entire career was spent in studying uh, bacteria and viruses that spread among birds because the concentration of birds, uh, you know, for chicken and all the rest is so great that if that kind of virus hap would happen, he knew uh, and scientists knew it would spread around the world. So we knew something like this was going to come. But October of November last year, we didn't know how soon it was going to come. And we didn't, we didn't realize how costly uh, our unpreparedness was. And I think for us at this, uh, at this juncture, uh, moving forward, uh, we have to realize that we are in a lot of trouble about the environment. Uh, we're, we're like in October or November of last year in relation to the kind of environmental, uh, environmental cataclysm that is waiting just around the corner if we don't get prepared and if we don't start to take uh, what's called mitigating action or, or action to help minimize the, the bad effects of hundreds of years of ignorance and greed that have driven us uh, to the mess we're in. So eco-theology says, you know what? Concern for the earth 
doesn't start with human beings. Uh, whatever, however we understand God as creator or as the spirit in all of creation, it's not all about us. Uh, it's, it's about all of creation. And so ecotheology makes us, to, makes us both rethink who God is in the light of how God is revealed through creation and makes us rethink who we are in relation to that creation because the way we relate to creation is inseparable from the way we relate to God. But it also changes our relations with each other, our ethical obligations in relation to each other if we live in a planet that has real actual environmental limits that we have to respect. Uh, suddenly, just as going outside without a mask or going outside coughing on people uh, has an obvious effect. Well, we find out that so many things we do are also having an effect on our neighbors. And what maybe is even scarier, the people who will suffer the most from things we're doing now are our children's children's children, right? And, and the potential destruction of the world that they'll inherit uh, is so great that it makes us say, if we could go back to November and December, knowing what we know now, or maybe even better, we could go back a year or two or five years, if, what would we do differently, be better prepared for, for what we're going through now? So when you, when you think of preparedness, I want to be cautious here, is preparedness isn't being, uh, preparedness includes being adaptable and, and open and all of that, but preparedness means being paying attention. Is that what you mean? I think so. I'm glad you clarified that. Um, I, I think preparedness means not sleepwalking. Yes. I think preparedness means not being stuck in a rut of everydayness. Some people call it normalcy syndrome. Oh, this is normal. First, this is false. What we're about to say is this is the way it's always been. Well, it's not, but we think that. This is normal. It's the way it's always been. This is the way it'll always be. Sorry, no. And, and that's when, and that normalcy bias, that everydayness, that complacency uh, is, is what really can be uh, destructive to us. In, in evolutionary terms, it's the dinosaurs before the uh, comet hits, you know. Yeah. What, how is say, your contemplative uh, practice, your contemplative uh, thinking, uh, influencing your take on this uh, situation we're in and your personal life, et cetera? Yeah. Well, you know, I think when I look outside of myself and I see people desperate contrasting the normal that they've lost and what they have now, and they just want to go back. They're stuck between two options, what I have now and what I had before. Those are my only two options. Part of what a contemplative mind does is it makes us suspicious whenever we present ourselves with, uh, with two options like that and say, says, well, there might be more and there might be more going on and maybe I shouldn't be just in my reaction uh, and, and I should calm my, uh, my anxieties that want me to fix things right away. Maybe before I get so furious, I should become curious and start to say, I wonder what's really going on. And you know, that move to curiosity is often the difference between panic and reactivity and breakthroughs into new wisdom. Mm. I like that, uh, furious to curious. That's a, a nice shift indeed. Um, uh, what is there? What keeps you up at night? In a good way or a bad way? Both. Okay. Bad. Well, okay. Uh, I mean, this. I think we are in a critically dangerous moment because I think our religious institutions have failed to teach people anything close to what Jesus meant by the gospel, and I think what they've done instead is they've They've taught people how to just keep surviving as drones in the status quo. You know, keep people feeling like forgiven and happy drones to keep the status quo going. I mean, in my country, I see how we did that in slavery. In both of our countries, we did it with the land theft. Um, and, but we've also done it while we're destroying the earth. And, and while we let more and more wealth get funneled to a smaller and smaller percentage of people and leave more and more people more and more vulnerable on the margins, you, you realize that our religion has basically said, 
oh, listen, you're going to heaven when, you're di when you die. Don't pay attention um, to that man behind the curtain. And, and as a result, what keeps me up at night is this sense that if religion fails, it's not like nothing happens. Oh, religion goes away. No, if religion fails, then all of these other dynamics have no, nothing left to challenge them. And that's, I suppose, what makes me think we need a vibrant spiritual and religious life to help us access those deeper resources and see from a wider framework and to ask questions of ethics and beauty and value, not just questions of profit and loss. So that keeps me up at night in, I suppose, in a negative and positive way, because I can't give up. I just think, yeah, I think a lot of religion is failing, but let's say we wrote it off as a failure. We'd have to start again tomorrow. What are we going to do? <laughs> and we'd be talking about value and sacredness and vision and, and, and internal formation, and we'd have to recreate the whole thing tomorrow. So you might think that that's even what's going on is a kind of death of old things that aren't working and resurrection of things that we, we can't live without. Well, and that's what gets your heart pumping in a really good way. It does. Yeah. Yeah. That's what gets you up into the, the opportunity. Pardon me? And that's what gets you up moving into the day. Yeah, it does. I mean, the other thing that gets me up uh, day after day is just that, I mean, this is a beautiful world and every day is such a gift and, Gosh, I don't want to, you know, I, I don't know how many days I have left. So I sure want to be sure I enjoy each one and savor it and experience the gratitude and wonder and awe of all that. Thank you. I, uh, I want to thank you for uh, your time with us back in the fall, pre-pandemic, and then the, the opportunity to be he here in the midst of this. Uh, and I think your reminder, your invitation, your curiosity, uh, your passion uh, will has insp inspired me. I know our, our church community and the wider community too. So I want to say thank you for that. Uh, we hope uh, that we learn deeply uh, and pay attention through this so that we don't go back, but that we actually step forward into whatever God is calling us to. And I give thanks okay. for well, thanks. Well, can I just say, uh, gosh, doesn't it feel like a decade ago that we were together and it was just you know, six months, seven months, and it just was like a different epic. But I have such good memories and I have bragged about your church to so many people since I saw you and none of us know, you know, what the future holds. But can I just say how I think congregations like yours are blazing a really important trail and we need you and thank you for your leadership and your whole team and the whole congregation uh we're, we're all in this together and and the breakthroughs and discoveries that we have in one place is one of the realities of a contact uh, of a connected world is they can spread everywhere and uh i i hope that you uh, i hope that you spread I know this might be too soon to use this metaphor, but these spread the right kind of contagion, <laughs> that, there's the, that there's the right kind of contagious joy and vision and creativity because that's what you all surely have. God bless you. Thanks very much, Brian. Best to you.